Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. I am CJ Lou, and you can find us on uh, YouTube at the Fire It Up with CJ page if you're curious, and also on Facebook. And today we have a really, really fun show. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to write your memoir. And we have Brenda Peterson, who is the author of this lovely book, Your Life is a Book, How to Create and Publish Your Memoir. Uh, so welcome, Brenda. Thank you very much for having me. You know what's so interesting? I have no desire to write a memoir, and I found this book fascinating. I couldn't put it down. It's really interesting because as I was reading through here, I thought this is almost a life coaching exercise to answer some of the prompts. You have a, I guess this is a writing thing. You have some prompts that you would ask yourself to kind of contemplate. They're life coaching questions. They're I found the whole book fascinating, even though I have no interest in writing a memoir. Well, you and your audience are interested in expanding your life, growing your life spiritually as well as psychologically. So it would make sense that by telling your life story, you would become very much more aware of the kind of purpose of your life. Mm. And I think memoir and telling your life story makes you happier and much healthier. Mm. Mm. Is that because you've written uh, several memoirs? Is that what you experience after writing your books? Healthy, uh, healthier, happier, and more aware of your life story? Absolutely. When you look at yourself from a more detached point of view as a character, mm -hmm. first of all, you have a sense of humor about yourself, which often we lack when we're telling our stories to friends. You get so passionate about your own point of view that you forget that, in fact, in other people's stories, you might be a villain or a hero. <laughs> and it helps that I spent my early life as a novelist, so I was always imagining other points of view than my own. Mm. When I came to write memoir and tell my life story, I began to use those same kind of narrative skills. And one of the questions I always ask my students is, what is the story you are telling yourself about yourself to yourself? And that that question actually came from one of my longtime students, John Runyon, mm -hmm. who came up with that, and I ask that all the time. What are you saying about yourself to yourself in your life story? Yes. What were you saying about yourself to yourself in the life stories that you wrote in the memoirs? Or I, I started writing first-person memoir as a personal essayist. Mm -hmm. And I had an agenda because I speak for a lot of different animals, like wolves and whales mm -hmm. and dolphins. And so I wasn't really that personal when I first started using I, I, I. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was kind of behind the mask mm -hmm. of animals. And in my first memoir, Build Me an Ark, A Life with Animals, mm -hmm. I was able to just witness and talk about conservation and the natural world. And ironically, the subtitle of that book originally was A Spiritual Life with Animals. And that got cut in the editing. Oh! Yes, yes. So when I began to write formula, you know, memoir, strict memoir that wasn't just about animals, I began to understand that I had to become a character myself and look at myself with that kind of humor, that kind of self-effacing, and that perspective that says, oh, look at me, look at... Look at the effect I'm having on other people, and how does that change them? Mm -hmm. You know what? We have a we have an interesting thing happening where we have noises coming through. It must be the whales talking to us. Your spirit animals are trying to communicate yes. with us. Are you? Are you? Do you hear it now? Is no. it still there? No. Isn't that weird? It was almost like it was an. It's seriously. It sounded like an animal in the background. I was like, oh. Your spirit animals are coming through the microphone when you're <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be weird because I've spent most of my life underwater with dolphins. And did it sound like this? No, <sighs> no but it sounded like underwater. It felt like an underwater sound. Isn't that fascinating? I just have the weirdest things happen on this program all the time. <laughs> They're very intelligent, and I'm right here in West Seattle on the water. Yes. So who knows? Yeah, interesting. Okay, so I was I was listening to the dolphin sounds who were singing in the background as you, 
as you were talking about how when you were communicating with animals, it was about actually putting yourself in the story as well. And that that was kind of your first kind of understanding about writing a memoir. Yes. So I came to it not as a human. Mm -hmm. And my friends always joke that I'm only half human. <laughs> Maybe you did hear them coming through. I did. <laughs> I heard your voice and your inner voice, and I have no idea on the recording if it will pick up, but I hope it does because it's it's actually kind of fascinating because you hear your voice and I hear like an, a chorus behind you. Yeah. It's really I cool. Love that. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, Probably come through, don't you think? Because yeah. radio is a very mystical kind of airways. It's very mystical, and many people have inner voices that are meant to be heard. And one of the things that happens when you write memoir is that that inner voice comes through. Mm. Want it to or not. Mm. What is the voice? Because I know that um, when you're reading your book, when I was reading your book, uh, Your Life is a Book, you would talk a lot about the developing your voice. And even with radio, the people say, you know, you need to figure out what your voice is. Yes. What does that mean? Because you have inner voices, you have, you know, your running sarcastic dialogue voice, which I have. Like, what does it mean to figure out what your voice is? I think finding your own voice takes a lifetime, don't you? I mean, you, you do this radio show, you have yeah. a lovely, strong voice. I'm a singer. Mm -hmm. I come from a family of singers, and I've sung all my life, and I sing in a, in a chorale called Seattle Metropolitan Singers here mm -hmm. in Seattle. And so I come to the voice as a writer with a musician's ear and a singer's ear, mm -hmm. and I really do write for the ear. So if you read my novels or my memoir, you can read it aloud because it's meant. And when I, when I had the audiobook, I read it. So you can hear my voice in my audiobook of sister stories as well as I want to be left behind. But finding your voice is not is not a fast thing. Many people hate their voices when they hear it on radio. Have you noticed that? They oh, hear yeah. their voices on radio and they say, Oh, I hate my voice. And I think, well, if you hate your voice, who else is gonna like it? <laughs> Okay, well, I found out that one of the problems is maybe it's not dolphin, but my volume. So I'm going to see if I can turn my volume down a little bit and see if that actually helps things a tad bit. So we'll see. Um, okay, let's see if that's going to work. Um, well, you know, actually what I found is, oops, so now I've turned the volume off. Okay, um, what, I, what I found in my own experience is that your voice is, it's almost like finding yourself is finding your voice. So as you said, it's a, it's a journey, right? Yes, yes. And writing a, writing a book is a journey, and you will be a different person at the end of the journey as when you began it. Mm. There's a wonderful quote from Jung, the great psychologist, that says, the encounter with the creature changes the creator. And I can tell you in my 30 years of teaching that every person who finishes a memoir is a different person. Mm. And I think they're always a much better person. Mm. They're usually more self-aware, kinder, more spiritual, more compassionate, and as I said before, happier and healthier. Mm. Did you find that with yourself, that you were healthier, happier, kind of more insightful, more spiritual, all those different things after you finished your memoirs? Yes, because all of the great mystical teachers teach us to know ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if you know yourself, as Shakespeare says, true to yourself, you cannot be false to any other man. Mm -hmm. Or as the Delphic Oracle says, know thyself. Mm -hmm. And there's a great spiritual wisdom in knowing, you know, meditation. You watch the, you watch the mind. You watch the soul. You, you have a certain bit of, like I said, humor. You can stand back and say, oh, look at her. She's up to that again, you know? <laughs> and, and that also comes from witnessing yourself and others in sometimes very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that is also a great pleasure in writing about these difficult situations with a certain kind of detachment. And I, I don't mean emotional detachment because you need that emotional attachment but with a certain kind of look at that person, look at that character I've made of myself. Mm -hmm. 
and who is she becoming and what is she teaching and what is she teaching others mm, you know in um, spiritual practices they talk about the meta position which is a part of you floats up you kind of take the wiser bigger picture of you and you look down at the scenario and you see it from multiple perspectives aside from your own perspective and it feels like in the process of writing that that's you know when you pull yourself up and out and looking down at all the characters and seeing what role you're playing it's kind of a similar kind of experience it sounds like when you're describing it to me one of my first memories is of being in the forest service cabin on the high sierras where my father was in the forest service mm -hmm. And I actually drew it once for my parents from the point of view of the rafters. Oh. So I think I was in and out of my body very early on <laughs> and have spent a lifetime learning how to be embodied. Mm. Part of being embodied is knowing your story. Mm. And I think you asked me in, in some of your questions on email, how do you get to know yourself? Yeah. Well, one of the tools that I teach in this book, and I've written this with my literary agent, we can talk about publishing later, but one of the ways to get to know yourself is to write an exercise that's in the book called One Scene That Explains Your Whole Life. Mm. And another way is to say, if I could only tell one story, and I was going to die after I told that story, after like Scheherazade, what would that story be? Mm. That immediately focuses you and makes you think, wow, this might be the story of my life. The great mm -hmm. story of your life has yet to be told. Mm. Think it's something like, oh, I had a bad marriage, or oh, I went to the Peace Corps and I was in Nepal, or oh, you know, I survived cancer. But in fact, you might find that your best story is something you least expected. Mm. It only comes with doing the exercise. Mm -hmm. And going through a deep contemplation. All right, so I have some questions going back all the way back to just the basics. Like, what is a memoir? So is a memoir just your personal story, or is it more than that? A memoir is different from an autobiography. Mm -hmm. An autobiography is the kind of dutiful march of facts. I was born here. I got married here. I had this career. And it has to be chronological mm -hmm. because it's more like Wikipedia. Mm-hmm or, you know, who's who. But a memoir is a true story that's written with narrative technique, so it reads like a novel that just happens to be true. Mm. Okay, so that's the difference between, so, and, and, and you know, it's funny, my grandfather, bless his soul, he uh, died when he was 101, and he decided to type out his autobiography, and it's probably about six to eight pages, and I try to read it with my son, and God bless his soul, but it was one of the most boring things that I've ever read. I mean, I really had to force myself to read all the facts, because there's something very bland. Dry. Yeah. And, there, and so when you're talking about the arc of a story and writing in that way, how is that different than a factual replaying of all the, you know, the events of my life? I was born, I went to, what, what's the difference? A memoir does not have to be in the order that it's lived. You can write a memoir based on emotional chronology. Oh. For example, some of your listeners, they seem to be very spiritual, they seem to be very evolved, and people who are searching for truth. Mm -hmm. So maybe your memoir would be my spiritual memoir. And there's mm -hmm. a chapter in this book on spiritual memoirs. Mm -hmm. And that would be organized by your understanding of spirit mm -hmm. and the experiences and the stories that led you to have a very, very different understanding of mystical spirituality than perhaps your Catholic or in my, in my case, Southern Baptist upbringing. And mm -hmm. that's why I wrote the memoir, I Want to Be Left Behind, Finding Rapture Here on Earth. And it's interesting because in that memoir, I became a comic character. And in the earlier memoir, Building an Ark, I think I was more of a tragic character, thinking about the end of the world, thinking about extinction of species. You know, I had some compassion fatigue, and I wanted these stories to move people to action. Hmm. And, and I want to be left behind. There's so much humor. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, I love it when people write me and say, I, I just got an email right before we went on air saying, I was a Quaker and your book saved my life because I learned <laughs> to laugh at myself. And that's part of my spiritual path. So is there, is there, is there an emotional arc to it? So one, one of the listeners asked, can you explain what it means? Because you were talking about the arc and that maybe you have some spiritual insight. So were the insights the way that you wrote chapter by chapter or was it the, and then you're also talking about kind of your emotional reaction to the whole yes. thing or was it both? Okay, let me give you an example. One of my students came to me at 70. Her name is Mary San mm -hmm. Grunewald. And she was working on a Japanese American internment camp story. Mm -hmm. And she had been in her teenage years when she was interred here in Washington and then in California. And when she began writing the story, it was just a survival story. It was mm -hmm. just this happened, that happened, the war came, and we did this, and that became a nurse. And through the years that she worked on it, and she published it at 80. Mm. And it's a bestseller. Wow. It's called Looking Like the Enemy. Mm -hmm. And when she was writing it, she began to become aware that her mother, Mama San, had taught her many, many truths, especially when you're dealing with someone who treats you like the enemy because you look different. Mm. And therefore, you go to prison. And so she organized her whole memoir based on what she learned about looking different. Mm. So it's not just chronological. It's very emotionally uh, dramatic. Mm -hmm. And the thing about memoir is that it has to have a plot. The mm -hmm. plot of a memoir is the evolution of the soul. And I say that a million different times to my students. And sometimes it takes them a year and they go, oh, it's about the evolution of my soul and who I become. It's not who I was. Mm, okay, got it. So it's this evolving story, which is the arc. I didn't even, I, I always heard the arc of a story, and I'm not even sure what that means. And I looked it up, and then after reading it, I still wasn't sure what it meant. But it said this episodic kind of, what is the arc of the story? And is it really the evolution of the soul that is really part of it? Or how's they, how are they related? That's my opinion. Other people will have other opinions. But when editors ask, what's the arc? What's the narrative arc of this story? At, uh, agents or writers will say something like, it's how I grew and changed and then helped others grow and change. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative arc. So you might start with not knowing something and then it's how you learn something. Mm -hmm. Or you might say it starts with how I wanted to travel but was afraid because I had agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. or then I learned to do this, and then this episode, and then this happened, and then someone came along and taught me this, like my boyfriend said, travel with mm. me. So it's, it's, think of it like Pilgrim's Progress. You know? <laughs> right. And think of it like it always has to have some sort of forward movement. Editors talk about what's the forward movement, what's the plot, what's the drama. So instead of thinking arc, because that's a little bit more esoteric, yeah. think of a plot. Right. And I always say to my students, each chapter, you must change and grow. Right. Yeah, I like one of the things that in your book, Your Life is a Book, you, you talk about this is not a, a griping session where you're trying to take vengeance and, you know, finally get your witness of like, this. look at this, how I've suffered. It's not necessarily what that is about. It's about the story of your evolution and kind of taking the meta perspective and seeing... Ah, interesting. I was suffering, but then I found out this huge, like, juicy bit about life, which I think is interesting because I think probably a lot of people would just view it as a way of venting. No, those don't work. You know, that that's what I call misery memoir or, <laughs> or unprocessed pain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if the reader doesn't get a gift out of your life story or if you don't have a lesson that you learned that you can teach – then it's just a family and friends memoir. It's just something like, hey, here's my life, here's some photos, here's my blogs, and have at it. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to reach an audience and have people write you and, and say, I love this book, then you have to do what editors call a payoff. There has to be something, a gift, at the end of this long book 
that you give to your readers. And mm -hmm. I feel that we are responsible for that mm -hmm. in every way when we tell our life story. It's interesting because in blogs, you just mentioned blogs. Yes. And to me, it seems like, well, there's a real connection between a memoir and a blog. But blogs have this kind of sense where there is no payoff, right? You go. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I ate pizza. Yeah, and like you go into some like long, you know, exposition about the pizza or waiting in line and how irritating it is, but there may not, some of them have a payoff, but oftentimes there isn't a payoff on a blog. Well, what is the difference between a blog and a memoir? You know, a blog is usually quick. It's usually a slice of life. Mm -hmm. It's a, a little window. It doesn't connect to anything else necessarily, unless your blog is a political blog or it's a themed blog, mm -hmm. like how to lose weight or, mm -hmm. you know, how I discovered mysticism or, you know, saints I've known or something like that. Yeah. Uh, blogs are more like conversations with a stranger. Right. One-sided conversation. One-sided conversation. Yes. Or like being trapped in an elevator with somebody or on a plane. <laughs> I was once on a plane to go to Japan and someone sat down to me and next to me and said, I'm going through a terrible divorce. I just have to tell somebody Oh and no! on a piece of paper and held it up. I am a deaf mute <laughs> and the person changed their seats, went back and bored someone for 11 hours. And um, I look at blogs. I don't read a lot of blogs. And I do have my own blog, but it's not every day. I look at blogs as just a kind of riff or a rant or an insight or an offering. Mm -hmm. But it's not connected to a bigger story. And mm -hmm. it's not crafted. And it's not complete. It's just a moment. Mm -hmm. And how you know, one of the things in, in your book, Your Life is a Book, there's a chapter on what's the difference between a blog. And, and one of the things I thought was interesting is if you start seeing a string and you can string them all together, then your blog becomes a story. But if not, they're just like little, like you said, little episodic or little pieces of rants or little yes. insights, right? Yes, but you know, there have been some bloggers who have gone on to write books that have done very well, mm -hmm. and we talk about those. Mm -hmm. It's it's really it's really usually with the help of an editor or a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. That they're able to string those together in a story. Okay, so that's different than an autobiography, which is just kind of a, you know, factual chronological order, is different than a blog post, and that it's not, you know, there's a payoff. And it's yeah. different than a personal journal, which is kind of basically what that woman wanted to do on the plane, <laughs> which is this unedited, unfiltered kind of emotional processing. Yes. And 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 how is it? And, and I think you also told us how it was different than when you were writing a novel. Mm -hmm. Now, the next question that I have, the set of questions are like, how do you know it's worth it? Like. When when you looked at you know your you know you wrote a bunch of novels and then this idea of a memoir kind of arose within you how did you know it's like it's worth it because you know it's, it feels like there's the tendency of like that story has been told a million times why should I tell that story who wants to hear my story that seems to be that that's what popped into my mind when I was reading this right, so right. how how do you address those kind of questions very few people feel worthy to write a memoir. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. And yet, 75% of my students are writing memoirs. Mm -hmm. And I have several theories about that. But in terms of the unworthiness, we all have these critics who sit on our shoulders and say things like, shut up, or you'll ruin the family, or no one wants to hear your story, or if we want to hear your story, somebody else should tell it. You know, we just have a million critics. Right. We don't really need critics because they're all right. Right here. Yes. I can feel them on my shoulders when I write. And, mm -hmm. and so my feeling is to ask the question, is my story worth telling, is not the right question to ask. Because after teaching for 30 years and working with hundreds of people and writing this book and getting all of this 30 years of teaching in the book. And of course, working with my co-author, who's worked with many best-selling memoirists and is a wonderful, wonderful mind to work with. Mm -hmm. I have come to feel, and I truly believe this, that every person has a story to tell about their lives. Every person and every life is worth writing about. 
<laughs> and I say that not necessarily as a publishing thing. It's it's not so much about the end product, whether you publish traditionally, whether you publish independently. Mm -hmm. It's about really understanding your life. And we say, this is the first paragraph of the book, which is, a memoir is like a love story with all the ecstasies, disappointments, and turning points of any relationship. And at the end, you might be surprised to discover that the love of your life is your life. Hmm. And I really believe that. I've seen, I just got a letter from a student who started with me about three weeks ago. She has osteoarthritis arthritis so bad that she's on a walker. Hmm. And I assigned her to write about her and a family member um, because she had this great story to tell about flying with this family member. And she just wrote me yesterday and said, I wrote this story and I am not using my walker right now and I am climbing stairs. Mm. Now, they will teach you, neurophysicists and, and neurobiologists, that the brain is infinitely elastic and it changes. And there's a New York Times article about that on my website about how writing memoir makes us happier and healthier. Mm -hmm. But I've seen physiological changes, not just emotional and psychological changes, but I've seen a woman who was deaf, who had two hearing aids come to me, work on a memoir, and now she has no hearing aids and much better hearing. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought when you were telling the story, they were writing about how they could you know, imagine as if you're saying literally this woman is walking and literally this person has no hearing. OMG. <laughs> From writing. Oh my God, that's fabulous. So I just had a major aha because if when you're saying what what clicked for me when you said everyone has a memoir, everyone has a soul and everyone's soul is evolving. That's why in fact we're here on earth. So everyone has a memoir. And and I think when you this is what kind of clicked in my head that synthesized all of a sudden. I think when you float up and you look at that stuff, there's something very healing because when you can see the truth, the ultimate truth, not your truth, but the ultimate truth of what's happening and you hear your voices, right? This, yeah. These voices around you, it's healing and you have these healing miracles. That's my theory. What do you think's yeah. happening? I absolutely agree with you and I've seen it. And it's not, it's not that you would do it for your own healing, although you do heal. Yeah. But you do it because if you don't do it, I think it's a sin of omission. I think every soul has a story, and every soul wants to look and, and understand its story and then tell its story. Mm -hmm. Because you said it, why else are we here if not right. to learn and grow and change? Right. And storytelling is all about epiphanies, which means a sudden aha. You know, I have a whole section in this book on building an epiphany, and I talk about that a lot with my students. I'll mm -hmm. say, what's the epiphany of this chapter? Or what did you learn in this chapter? And people will just say, oh, I forgot. I have to come up with something. Mm -hmm. Because so many people just want to get it on the page. Right. Mm -hmm. But after you get it on the page, that's when the real... Revision is the soul of genius, and that's when the real work begins. Okay, well, this is fascinating because, and I just so everyone has a story to tell about their soul's evolution. It almost seems like this is the journey of your life. Why wouldn't you want to, whether you write it down, I mean, whatever form it takes, because some people may paint it, some people may write it, some people will sing it, some people may compose something, but it's like this is the life of your story. And the kind of contemplation time to figure out what that story is. Why is your soul here? Why are you here on earth? Yes. That's compelling. You know, why wouldn't you want to write that you. And think about the legacy that you will leave. Yeah. I mean, if you have children or you have the next generation, whether you're an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent or whatever, children need to learn. That's one of the reasons our species has done so well, is mm -hmm. that we, be, we, are, we can pass down to the next generation mm -hmm. things we have learned, whether they take our advice and, or not. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. But it's almost a responsibility for us mm -hmm. to pass on 
And, you know, there's all these wartime stories that people, when people came back from World War II, they said nothing, remember? And we really suffered because of that. Mm. And now people are telling stories of Afghanistan. They're telling stories of Ferguson. They're telling stories of immigration. They're telling stories that we need to know because we really? need to grow. So I, I actually feel so happy to be able to have found um, this way of teaching people. People call me a book therapist. Yeah, people, absolutely. People, people say, I, I just had a student yesterday who has been wanting to write for a long time. Um, she's a foreign correspondent and she's a journalist, but she has another story to tell that's very compelling. But many journalists don't know how to write memoir because they keep the I out. Right, right? they're trained it's not a, to. So I teach them it's not just the I, but it's the I. Mm. And when you put that personal storytelling in, it, it's a whole other level of intimacy with your reader. And that way they can connect. And it's mm. not just facts on file. Mm. Right. You, t you talked before about the process. Like, the, Give us a big overview of you know what are the big steps that you want to take. So. Yes, I'm convinced I want to write a memoir. Okay, good. Now, what are the... I'm not sure if I'm convinced, but why not? Let's say I'm convinced. Let's say you come to me as a student. Yeah, I come to you and I'm like, okay, what are the big meta steps? Like, what are the milestones that I need to go through? Right. Give us a big picture of what they are. Sarah Jane, my agent and co-author, says, start anywhere because that's where you should be. Okay. And so I always say, don't necessarily start at the beginning. Just start. And I talk about quilt pieces. Mm -hmm. I love sticky pads. So I brought here to show you. Let's see if I can turn it over here. Yes. Oh, and fabulous. That, yes, I can see it. That is all the sticky pads that come from working on I Want to Be Left Behind. And when I first started this, I had a whole wall. <laughs> I had an entire wall in my apartment that was white. And I just took all these sticky pads and would put them up on the wall. And some people use butcher paper, or as my vegan students say, white paper. <laughs> and they would just put it up, and then you write these quilt pieces, which are just scenes. Uh, so written on each of those, because I noticed that some are blue, some are yellow, some are long, some are short. Um, what's And I can't read them clearly, but give us an example of like, so were these all these little vignettes, that little stories that you that kind of popped into your mind when you thought about writing that book? And so you had this whole, you know, slew of them. And how did you, what's the length, what's on each of those? I did not write the book in order. Hmm. I wrote it by scenes. Oh. And so the theme was, in this book, I Want to Be Left Behind, every scene I could come up with in which I was a misfit. Mm -hmm. I was a mystic and my family was dogmatic. Mm -hmm. And they're funny, like, you know, the scene where I get thrown out of vacation Bible school because the teacher, I'll move this over here now so you can see me, but yeah. how's that? that yes, okay? perfect, yeah. The teacher said to me in the middle of Sunday school, I think I was about nine, she said, get down on your knees and pray to God, I've lost my contact lens. <laughs> and I, at nine, already kind of a doubting Thomas, said, God's busy. <laughs> and so I got thrown out of Sunday school. But it was kind of good because I got sent that summer to live with my step-grandmother, who was what they would call now a shaman. Whoa. And she worked with herbs, and she was incredibly wise, though uneducated, mm -hmm. in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. And she taught me all about women's wisdom and herbs and healing. And she happened to be a beautician in a morgue. <laughs> and, she also, and she also had her own beauty parlor called Shea Virgi. <laughs> so she was a fabulous grandmother. And I also wrote about her in my very first novel called River of Light. So if anyone wants to read about my grandmother, read River of Light, because she's a hero in that story. So. You know, that was a scene where I got to write about Virgie again, and it's a chapter called Shall We Gather at the River, where my granddaddy took me down to the river to meet God. Oh, wow. So that's that yellow one over there. 
if you can see it. That's yeah. That so she, but, and for people on the radio, there's a big yellow sticky on a board that has like that's the store, the vignette of the of the whole thing. Or you know, it started with the story of of being in Bible school. That's Bible school. The next one is Shall We Gather at the River with Virgie. The next one is, oh, oh, <laughs> being in Berkeley, uh, having come from Virginia and being in Berkeley, where one of my mother's friends was a uh, kind of missionary to foreign students, and a dinner table scene where all these foreign students are there, and my mother's trying to convert them by doing East Indian cooking. <laughs> I scene. I know. And, and, and what we all said was, this food is so hot, even the untouchables won't eat it. <laughs> so that's that one. Okay. Wait, and then they were struck. So those are different stories. So you picked, you, you had all these ideas that you had. And so you started saying, ah, I want to be left behind is the theme that runs through these. Then it sounds like you took all those little sticky notes yes. and then you put them on maybe one board. This is, this is a big board. This was the final board. The, the original was on my wall. It mm -hmm. was giant. It mm -hmm. was a whole wall, a white wall with sticky pads. And I had to say to my students and my friends, just don't mind the sticky pads. I'm at work. Right. Yeah. And, and they got that. And this is the final one, which is all very organized. And it's because the book is done. But I didn't know the, the structure of the book until I wrote all these quilt pieces. Mm, and then you stitch them together using quilt as in you had all these little vignettes about, you know, river, a school teacher, you know, dinner with um, recruiting dinner. <laughs> yes. And then you kind of then and then how did you how did you know how to organize it? You know, like we said, you make doesn't have to be chronological, but it's an evolution of their soul. Is that how the organizing principle? Well, I started in the present. Mm -hmm. I started right here on my beach. I'll see if you can see my beach. You probably, can you see my beach? Yes, in West Seattle, gorgeous, yes. My beach, I've lived here, not particularly here, but on this beach 30 years. And it starts off in the present when I'm sitting on my beach with a seal pup. Mm -hmm. I started a group called Seal Sitters. Mm -hmm. And we sit with pups and protect them from off-leash dogs and from people with cell phones or people who want to come up and kick them to see if they're alive, things like that. And I know. You're and kidding. I was sitting there with my neighbor, George, who I'd known for many years, and suddenly he started proselytizing me about the end of the world and the rapture. <laughs> That's shocking, especially in Seattle. Especially in Seattle. And I thought, oh, my God, I've moved 3,000 miles away from my family, and here they are. Again. Again. But because he was my neighbor and he was a seal sitter and I liked him, and he'd always been a really good neighbor – we actually had a conversation about the end of the world and why he was so cheerful about it. Interesting. Because, you know, rapture people can hardly wait to check out, you know. Right, They right. have rapture-ready signs, and they're like, beam me up, Scotty, kind yeah. of. Yeah. So we actually had a very tender and funny and intimate conversation, which I would never have with someone maybe in my family who was more dogmatic. Mm. And so he ended up he ended up saying this I ended up saying you know George <laughs> if you left if you raptured up we'd say there goes the neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> and he started laughing and we just carried on and so that's the first chapter because that sets all the major themes right it's the, the uh and the it pattern also, so to speak I, it also shows that I've survived. Yes, right? yes. And then it flashes back to the childhood. Mm. So that's one way to structure it. Now, that board was probably a lot bigger. You know, you had your whole wall that you distilled down. And how did you know what to cut and what not to cut? And, you know, because with quilting, it's probably easier because there's a pattern. But yes. Or is it the same? No, I think it's the same, Cindy, because many quilters are so good that they just come up with a lot of different pieces and then they get the pattern mm. you know they don't have the pattern especially if they've been quilting a long time they'll just sit down with a bunch of people and say let's make all these pieces and then they get the pattern and i think that's the way i teach memoir mm. quilt pieces and then figure out the structure and then figure out the pattern and i tell you it always happens 
Hmm. So give me an example of the pattern. So you had the, I want to be left behind. It was like the thread that knitted all these stories together. And then right. what were the patterns that you saw? Um, you know, and you had these, and on each of the stickies, you have little stories. Right. Um, right. What was, what was the themes or, or. I, I, that's a really great question. I think that for me, the pattern was me understanding that I really wasn't a misfit. I might seem like a misfit in this family of very conservative, far right, religious right, Southern Baptist, but we had common themes. We had things that united us, like animals, like music, like love. Mm. And so each chapter, I wanted to find a way to find a common theme with people who I don't seem to have a lot in common with spiritually or politically. Mm. And, and I really wanted to walk a middle path. And I hope that I've done that. Mm. You know, and, um, and a lot of the spiritual folks I talk about, they talk about you have a soul's journey and a soul mission. And you have um, soul mates, which come in the form of family members, loved ones, or friends that are all there to help you discover the essence of who you are and help your soul evolve. And so what I just heard, at least when I just heard what you just said, it was almost like, the oh, look, there's an animal, a cat. <laughs> I love it. I was like, now I actually am seeing animals. <laughs> <laughs> but but um hey, and his name is Dow T A O. Oh hi Dow. Oh, he's my little Dow cat. Hi he, honey. Like so he, but it's almost as if those the it's like your journey with your soul and there is the theme. I mean all those people in your life are helping you kind of evolve your soul. It's interesting. Even you know I think it was Gurdjieff, the famous mystic Gurdjieff, who said he always kept an enemy close because sometimes they were the greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of Obama, who's talked about you know, the team of rivals, which mm -hmm. is something Roosevelt did. I think that if you are not in touch, I mean, I'm here in Seattle, very unchurched, very spiritual, very liberal, very environmental, um, wonderful place. Most of my relatives are in Florida and Virginia, which are very, to me, behind the times in the environment and very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. And yet, we have a conversation that goes back and forth between these two often polarized camps. And I have learned as much from my brother, who in fact is a military man and who is quite conservative, but he read the entire manuscript of I Want to Be Left Behind and made really good, he didn't censor it, but he made very good suggestions and he asked very, really good, honest questions that made me go deeper. Mm -hmm. And he and I are totally different in many, mm -hmm. many ways. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want to touch on that point because I think that that would be a big problem with writing a memoir is you have family members. In this case, your brother helped you dig deep, deeper and you're open to listening to the comments. But often in family memoirs, you have your truth of what happened and the other people have their truth. And like you said in the very beginning, you may be the villain and you think you're the angel. Yeah. So how do you reconcile that? You know, these are truths from your perspective. And plus there are there's stories that you're remembering for 50 years ago, right? So they may not even be 100% accurate. So how do you deal with that? Oh, I teach many classes on that, and I write about it a lot. There's a chapter in this book called The Truth, The Truth, and Nothing But, question mark, because one thing that happens is you just have to assume that every person in a family has a different life, has a different childhood, has a different experience of childhood. Um, in, my, in my particular childhood, I have very different sibling points of view, mm -hmm. and there is no one way. And there is no one truth. We all know that, unless you're a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. And of course, in my family, there are many fundamentalists. Right. So there is one truth. They wanted one truth, and they wanted to have control over some of the material. So for those people who wanted to censor me, they did not get to read the manuscript before publication. So you just didn't include them as part of it. I talked to them, but I did not include them. They did not have final say. They could not read it because I knew that would just be a, a giant. It'd be like talking to a fundamentalist about Taoism. Right. You know, or talking to a fundamentalist or someone who believes you're going to hell about being a Buddhist. 
Right. Uh, it's just, it's, it, it, those conversations don't work. So don't get feedback from when you, 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 you know already which people are not going to like it. Don't give feedback in the process of getting feedback. Don't get feedback. That's how you avoid no. these challenging don't, scenarios. Don't get feedback from people who have the agenda of you telling their story, ah. not yours. So say, oh, I have, I have a confidentiality agreement with all my students, so I, I can only use certain things that have already been published. Mm -hmm. um, my students did a book called Secret Histories, mm -hmm. Stories of um, Truth and Revolution and Revelation. And it's a really big seller, and they all wrote memoir in that. And I think the subtitle is Risk, Courage, and Revelation. And I was preparing them for horrible things to happen. And in fact, it was a love-in with everyone who read their stories. And I, mm -hmm. I take that as a compliment to our group, the Salish Sea Writers, because we work so hard to not alienate people and yet tell the truth. So mm -hmm. here's the bottom line on telling your truth. Number one, trust the people who have an ability to see beyond their own story, to see yours mm -hmm. as readers, mm -hmm. whoever that might be. That's usually not family. Right. It sometimes can be, like with my brother and my nieces, who were wonderful, wonderful right, editors. Right. But if people get angry and they want to censor you and say, that never happened, or you're lying, or that's not the truth, you simply say this to them. I look forward to your book on the subject. Right. <laughs> it's a hard thing to write a book. It took me a lot of pain and growth to write my books. And they can write their books and tell their truths. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's maybe one writing tip of a memoir. What are some other, in terms of, one, um, what are some other tips that you may want to give people who are considering, if your top five writing tips of things that they may want to consider? I actually have on my website 10, the top 10 writing tips. Oh, okay, good. Tell us your website so we can look it up. BrendaPetersonBooks.com. And where are those tips? In your blog? They are, or? They are under the Your Life is a Book. Okay, got it. They're also in Your Life is a Book. Oh, gosh. Did you not see them? No, sorry. I'll look back and see them. You can look back. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link on my page, too. Okay. But I, okay. Have a, I have a... One of the things that I have as a tip, if you're writing a spiritual memoir, which many in your audience might be, yeah. is focus on the questions, not the answers. Focus <laughs> on the journey, not the destination. Focus on people who inspired you and taught you, not necessarily what you are teaching. Even oh. though, of course, you have to teach. But if you can kind of look at it as you being a doorway for other, other wisdom, and a listener, and the best way to find your own voice is to listen. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give your audience, since they're listeners, a wonderful uh, exercise from the book, and it's mm -hmm. called the eavesdropping exercise, where you mm -hmm. go with a friend to Starbucks or some coffee house, you sit down with your computers, and you listen to the conversations around you, and then you each type up what you heard, and I will tell you, you will each have filtered and heard very different conversations. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. That's interesting. So that's a exercise in knowing that you each have your own truth and that you listen and hear the world differently mm -hmm. because you filter. Mm hmm. And so some person is going to be listening to one side of the conversation and not the other. Some person's going to hear something that another person doesn't hear. And that really gives you an understanding of what memoir is and how very different it is and how I think if you write your memoir, you will change your life, and I hope change the life of your readers. Hmm. Now, tell us a little bit about, so you told us about your website, Brenda, and so it's B-R-E-N-D-A-P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N.com? Books. Brenda Peterson Books. Books. Dot com. Dot com. Okay, and then tell us about the classes. Do you have online classes or are mostly? I will be having... Sergey and I are going to be doing uh, an audiobook and online classes. We have to set that up. Um, and right now I teach private classes. I used to teach at the university, but I teach private classes here in Seattle. And you can go on my website and write me through my website, and I'll put you on my waiting list. Yeah, a waiting list. My goodness. <laughs> well, this has been a very successful book. Yeah. And, um, I'm very proud about that. It's my biggest selling book. 
and I think it'll be around for a long time. And so if you're on my waiting list, just read the book. And yes. I actually do bring people in, at least one or two people every season. Okay, and is it one of those processes where um, you have to be interested in writing a memoir or just? You could be interested in writing anything. Or I, I actually have a student who's a leadership guy and he uses my, my techniques in his leadership, leadership seminars. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much for, and we're going to have to come back because we, we didn't have a chance to talk about um, getting published. Would you come back and talk to us about that? Of course. Yeah, because there's tons of questions and I think a lot of really good information. Folks are talking about your life is a book, how to create and publish your memoir. We're Brenda Peterson. I'm CJ Lou from the Fire It Up with CJ show. You can find this interview on YouTube and hopefully we'll do another interview so you can kind of get some more information. You can get some more information on getting published because we didn't handle all the logistics. My co-author in, who's a literary agent, Sarah Jane Fryman, and she could join us. Uh, oh, could she? That'd be great. Oh, I would love that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, listening audience. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support, love, and blessings.